Shalom again, it's Selak one more time, it's June 22nd, 2017. This lesson is entitled Hebrew Preservation. And I'm considering how the Hebrew language, if it is the original, might have been preserved without writing. So you know I've been talking about writing, trying to see if Adam wrote before. As far as I'm concerned, Adam did write. That's my personal feeling from the stuff I've covered and I've got more things to share. And as you listen to these lessons, bringing out my different points, you get to start to sense that there had to have been writing before we were led to believe that writing was. I didn't think this initially, I was just wondering, but the more I look into it, I realize something is very fishy. And so this lesson actually is looking at the writing, but also deals with the Hebrew. I've been tracing the, or trying to find the real language. Um, is it Hebrew or something else, or Aramaic or something else? But this one kind of touches on both the writing search that I'm doing and the Hebrew search that I'm doing as well. Now, you know when people start to expand and move around and so on, they, they begin to write something. And I talked already about the the need that Adam would have had if he's in the garden, he's doing his stuff, because it seemed like at one point, which would have mean other times as well, that Eve was by herself. And at that particular time, the serpent came and tempted her and he was not with her. So she was alone and she took the fruit to him afterward. So she was alone. Now, if Adam is going busy obeying the Creator and he's naming all these animals on the earth, if Adam is one person, one man, and didn't have children yet to, you know, if he's naming all these animals as well as doing other stuff, then he's busy. So there's going to certainly be teachings that are telling you, that will be telling you that his responsibility was dealing with Torah and the commandments of the Most High, of course. But you see, I mean, I have a problem with that because the physical story, I mean, sometimes you've got some allegories in the Bible, of course. The problem with this kind of story to just only be an allegory of the Garden of Eden is that it's coming right up on the heels of a real literal account of the creation of the earth and everything in it. So it's 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 not just that there is a physical um, creation going on where the world is being created because we know the creation story is not talking just as an allegory, although you can read certain allegorical stuff in it and learn all kinds of wonderful things and wisdom about Torah and, and the Creator and so on. But it has a very real um, physical truth to it, if I can put it that way. In that when he said, you know, he's making trees and he made the earth and so on, that's not just something allegorical. There's a physical earth being made and there is a physical tree being made. Because you and I can go pick some physical fruits from a tree or lean on a tree or get shade from it. Your foot touches the ground as a physical object. So this is a physical, uh, an account of a physical creation being done. Now, if a physical creation is being done in the creation story, and then it breaks, and then it tells you something else about a man called Adam and then Eve and the, and the garden, then you can probably say, okay, well, I can see how even though this whole Adam stuff is coming off the the heels of the physical creation story that the Adam part could just be allegorical and the Eden is just allegorical and just a a spiritual story trying to be told, a spiritual message being given. But I wouldn't actually separate the two stories like that because Adam is actually placed inside the creation story itself because after the creation story says that all these physical things were made in the earth and the birds and the animals and so on, It tells you that a physical man was also made. So if we, well clearly we are here, but if we see physical birds flying around and so on, and then eventually after all these physical things made, 
it says he made a man, then the man was physical. So there was a real man right there in the garden. There was a real man in that creation story. And so now, if this real man is in this creation story, then it's telling us that the, the opening couple chapters of Genesis is dealing with something very real and physical. So the, the story then cannot only be an allegory of other spiritual truths that we should learn about the Creator and about life. Because a physical man was in the story and we see ourselves are physical as well. So we know we came from him. And I just personally feel that if um, if the story is presented like that with physical objects and then I come around and see a physical object, then I know it's not just a spiritual message that's, that the story is being used to talk about because it's got some physical parts to it. It's like if you look at Ezekiel's wheel in the middle of a wheel and other stories like that in the Bible, um, then you might say, okay, that, that actually means something, as that wheel means this and the, the part in the middle of the wheel means that and so on. You don't normally see a wheel in the middle of the wheel like that. And, and you know, when you walk around every day and connect that with with the God of Israel, right? Or with the prophet. But when you see a physical man and when you look in the mirror yourself, you see someone who's physical and you can grab your other hand and see you are physical. So you know that the wheel in the middle of the wheel can be communicating some spiritual message that you should learn. But the man created in the garden is a real physical man because you can grab your own hand and touch and feel your own self and look at yourself in the mirror and see other people around as well. So this is physical. So I feel that the the story in the opening chapters of Genesis, since they are uh, since they are obviously real and physical um, about their accounts, the, the accounts of physical things, then there is a physical truth to them as well. Now look at this in Genesis chapter four. Verse 14, this is dealing with the Cain being banished now with this punishment. Verse 14, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive. Now notice here that if the Creator was trying to kill him right away, he would have just taken him out. But he says, you have driven me from the face of the earth, which among other things implies that he, wherever he goes by being driven to that next place, he is still able to survive. So there is life outside someplace else. There is, there's food out there as well. So we know there's life out there and there's people out there along with the food. So this is not just a case of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and now Abel is gone and now it's just Cain. Thy face shall I be hid and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. So if he is concerned with people finding him, there are people out there and that's why the Moses could drive him away because he wasn't trying to kill him right away. So he knows if he's driven away, then he can still survive because other people are surviving elsewhere. So there are other people around. Now, if he says, findeth me, what that communicates to me is that People, people are able to recall things. They are able to strategize. And this is just what I'm getting from the word findeth. They're able to recall. They're able to strategize. They're able to memorize things. They're able to plan. And they're able to plot. That's what I get that comes to mind when it says, find it me. 
Because if there was no, and I told you already, they said Jericho was already up and running eight to ten thousand years before Adam. So, and and I was saying as well too that you know if Eve was sometimes alone, Adam would have to make some kinds of markings to find his way back to Eve if he's going very far into a new era for the first time as he does his whatever routines as well as Eve if she needed to get to him she would need to know how to find him because remember the earth is very new it's very new you you get a, a new job and you're in this new big building that you've never been in before and you got to go up how many flights of stairs or elevators and go to this office and then that next room or whatever. And the next day you're trying to find your way again, but you went there yesterday. You still need to find it. So you're looking for markers on the building. Okay, the blue door and then and then turn right there and so on. Right? So they would have needed some way to find them to find their way around this garden as well. And it would have been a big place because as far as I can tell, Eden is dealing with with uh with luxury and delight and so on and that would have some amount of room to it like if it's got all these animals and so on it's going to have some space so they would have to do some markings in order to find each other and for adam to remember where he left off doing whatever he was doing the day before because this cannot just simply be an allegorical story there must be a physical truth to the story as well Whatever the fullness of the physical truth is, there must be a physical truth because we are here. So even, even if, you know, some say the, the garden story didn't happen exactly that way, it doesn't matter right here for what I'm trying to consider because none of us actually saw Eden, so we don't know how it was laid out and exactly, you know, all the details and so on. But there was something obviously happened. And um, so now if Adam is making markings, as I said a long time ago, then there he has started writing in the garden. Because what is writing? You you write your letter, letter A, and then you write your Aleph, and all the other letters in all the other languages that you speak out there. Writing is simply, as far as I can tell, as a lay person with this, the drawing of marks or the impressions that you make to represent something that you wish to communicate or remember. It's just a mark. Markings with meaning, though. Not just like doodling. The markings that have some intelligence to them because they mean something and they help um, in this case with Adam give you direction because it's like a map that he's making um, but it communicates something to Eve as well it communicates something to him how to get back to his job what he was doing and how to get back home to Eve so that they are both not on a new planet that they've never been on before because they've never lived before and they've never met anybody is because they two are the first people. And so if they go too far, Adam going out and he's like exploring, ah, then he can't get back home because he went so far that he got carried away a whole day's journey and he has no clue how to get back to Eve. And she's the only other person. What if he never finds her ever again? Endless meandering trying to find his way and never, never, never. He keeps going farther away thinking this was the way, this was the way. When he was only one day's journey, he keeps going, going. Then he said, oh, I think it was over there. He turns left, he turns right. And all of a sudden now he's five days away and he keeps going. No, it must be the other way. He tries and now he's 15, 20 days away. He'll never see this woman again. Now she gets concerned from the first day anyway, the first evening. She starts walking, look for him. Now she moves away farther from where she was in the first place and also ends up going in a different direction 20 days away from him. Now there's like 40 days of difference between them, of travel time. And then they go farther and farther, farther. These people will never know each other again. Common sense, which is... To me, 
what I'm gathering from what I learned that Torah is saying that you should be wise and so on and have some basic common sense that lets you not put your hand on a hot stove. Basic common sense communicates to you, don't put your hand on a hot stove, it's going to burn. Or basic common sense would tell me, if the man is dropped in a brand new world and the woman is dropped in a brand new world, they got to have some way to not lose touch with each other. You can't even take your child to Disney World or wherever, or some amusement park, and not trying to keep them so that they don't get lost. Because it's a new place and it's very busy, you might not find each other. So there must be a way... I would think the only thing to do because they didn't have pen and paper is for Adam to be marking stuff in the ground and so on. That is the beginning of writing. Marking on trees and so on. The placement of stones or whatever, right? Putting some twigs a certain way to say, hey, this is where, I was, you know. But when they're marking and drawing in the dirt, that is the beginning of writing. So the concept of writing was there before Sumer. It had to have been. Writing is just simply marking in an intelligent, purposeful kind of way to communicate something that would otherwise be communicated by words if one were present. So Adam started writing. There is no reason why 100 years later Adam would not have continued to build up on that marking which we call writing today. 200, 400 years later, 500, 600, 700 years later, you tell me Adam did not build upon that very well? Now, let me read a, a scripture here for you. Now, the, now, a good brother on Twitter pointed this out to me when I was communicating a, a different, um, dealing with a different topic, I think, uh, recently. So it wasn't about this, but it comes in handy right here. Um, uh, from Daniel chapter 1 and I think let me see where it is at um, I think verse 3 or 4 yeah okay Daniel chapter 1 and verse 4 um let me read verse 1 first. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. All right. So, so Jerusalem is besieged and so whatever. Okay, so now we got our people captured here. Now look at verse 4. Okay, now I'll just read 3 and 4. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, no, that of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful. Remember how Joseph was just dancing circles around them even though he was in prison and ended up rising right to the top in Egypt? And skillful in all wisdom. You tell me wisdom created the world. They were skillful in all wisdom. That means, I mean, come on, like, in all wisdom. Yet in Adam's time, sin and not yet happened and you're telling me Adam would not have had the wisdom to make some markings so he does not get disconnected from the woman and make the woman very afraid because she don't know where he's at and it's getting dark. He's going to make some markings to get his way back. He has started writing. And you might laugh and think this is silly. I'm going to drop some more stuff in this recording and give you something to think about some more. And so they were skillful in all wisdom and cunning as well. I mean, these people, are, these are Israelites. You see what Israel is going to become again in the future? Because we suffer now from a curse in Deuteronomy 28 from a confusion of faces. But when we were serving the Mosai and so on and back then, we were skillful in wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Bam, you got a poem right there. You tell me Abraham was from Chaldea. So now they're going to teach back the children of Israel Chaldea tongue, right? 
<laughs> they're going to teach them their own tongue. But that one's kind of tricky because there's different stuff to say about that. But anyway, but, but you get the picture here, though. That these people, the Israelites, they, they're so bad. Like, they, this king wasn't going to be waiting around 100 years for them to learn the Chaldean language. Because they were so skillful and whatever, he knew they were going to learn this in no time so that they can fit into the empire some more and serve them some more and so on, right? They're going to fit in very quickly, I should say, learn quickly and whatever. Why? Because they were so skillful in knowledge and whatever, they're going to pick up that language real fast. You see? These are the kind of people the Mosa is working with. These are Israelites. But way back then, of course, they weren't called Israelites. They were just people like in the line of Shem and so on, right? Coming from Adam and so on, going... And so on. So, these are the kind of people the Mosai dealt with. They were very smart, very wise, powerful in the mind. Powerful in the mind. That's why he could offer it as a curse to say you're going to have confusion of faces. You're going to be dumbed down. Because if they weren't wise and filled with all kinds of wisdom... It would not have been a curse to give them confusion of faces because that confusion of faces means that they're falling from somewhere. So they had to have been somewhere to let that let them fall and to let that become a curse unto them. These people are a different kind of people, the Israelites. And I read from you already, probably raise it again. Now let me try to see if I can find it back. Um Numbers twenty three nine. For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, they're talking about Israel. The people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Talking about Israel. So it's like Israel is people, yeah, but they're not reckoned among the nations because they're just different. They're different set-apart kind of people. They're different kind of people from the rest of the earth. No one in the Most High said, all the other nations, they're just like a drop in a bucket to me. It's like Israel is just a different kind of people. So now, if that is the case, would not Adam have been impressively similar and probably even more powerful and smarter since no sin had yet happened to drag him down to give him a curse? And you're telling me there's going to be like a thousand year wait for some other empire to come up in Sumer and make writing when all those people were not even righteous and set apart themselves? Writing has changed the world in such a very, very big way. And writing goes along with language and with tongue and with communication and speaking. Writing comes along with all that stuff. And the man Adam just doesn't know it? No. Somehow we've been given a story, a setting in Genesis that is not, not as straightforward as it, I would think it should be. So if Cain is afraid now that people are going to find him, that means people are living in probably far away areas from the Eden location, from where he's at. And so if people can find him, then people are searching and looking and people, you know. So now if people, that, that sounds to me like people might might find him, that like people are going to hear what he did, excuse me, and be on the lookout for him, possibly. Well, definitely, I would think. Take out the possibly. It's not that they're just going to by chance come. They, they find him is linked to the fear that he has of being found, which means people are looking for him like they're police. They want to find him because who has done this kind of thing? So if they're finding him, if they want to find him, that means people are spread out, people in different places, which is how he can also be pushed away and banished to someplace else because he can survive in other places like people are surviving in other places as well. Now, if people are in other places and there's all kinds of ship making and ship building and people traveling from one part of the earth to the next and so on and going across waters and so on because of all the studies that I've just started to do and you know more of those studies than I, you know people were going to all parts of the earth, even over here to the Americas and so on. And they're coming, some are walking, some are going on ships and so on. So that means that from very ancient times, people are dealing with ships, they're traveling, they're moving on foot, however they're getting there. Wouldn't these people like Adam started to write? Basically, Adam is trying to make a map, some sort of a map. But 
if he's only just writing then to communicate to himself how to find his way back, that's the starting of some kind of a map. So all these people with their ships and their traveling and so on, who might find Cain and he's scared of them, wouldn't they have made their own maps as well? When they're traveling on ships and so on, wouldn't they, and with their horses and whatever else they're traveling with, and their donkeys, wouldn't they have made their own maps to communicate to themselves and to everyone in their tribes how to find the location for that next resource that they just found and how to get back home? They're drawing maps. Now, if you're drawing maps, you're starting to deal with some kind of markings, which I said is writing. It's focused writing. I mean, focused drawing. Writing is focused drawing, deliberate drawing for purpose of communication. People would have been drawing maps from very ancient times. And we're no doubt drawing maps before the first map that we have been presented with in the modern world. And some of these maps that aren't even as old as they should be, so many people see them, including myself, see them, they say, oh, they don't make the maps very clear. Why? Because they don't want you to find out things. Now, look at clocks. If people are drawing maps from way back then, which means that they were writing because they have to write or draw to, in order to create the maps, or if you prefer, they have to make markings in order to create the maps, then what about clocks? What about clocks? Now, I'm looking at the pictures here. You know, I, I want to think I'll probably put some of these pictures in the videos, but it just takes so much. So I don't know if I'll end up putting the pictures in the video, but you can always just look up clocks yourself. Now, I'm looking at this one world's oldest calendar from inquisitor.com that's i-n-q-i-s-i-t-r so inquisitor.com the world's oldest calendar discovered might show when humans created time this article if you run the search for inquisitor.com world's oldest calendar discovered is from july 15 2013 by james johnson that way, if you're searching, you'll know you've hit the one that, I've, that I'm looking at. Okay, so it says, The world's oldest calendar has been discovered, and British archaeology, British archaeology experts believe it could provide insight into when humans first created the concept of time. The calendar dates back to 8,000 BC. I told you, Jericho, 8 to 10,000 BC. The calendar dates back to 8000 BC. That means people were making calendars. And according to this calendar that I'm looking at, if this is the one that they're talking about, it looks like it is. It's got writings on it. I want to say similar to the layout of the Akkadian, the Sumerian writings, but not exactly. But it's got all kinds of columns go from top to bottom. Um... But it's writing. It's clear that it's picking up, it's building up. So they got writing here on this calendar. All right. Now we know sometimes they make calendars with just stone, stones laid out and so on. But this one, someone was writing on this stone or clay because I didn't read the whole article yet. But 8000 BC was excavated in, a, how do you say this? Aberdeenshire, Scotland, by the National Trust for Scotland in 2004. Years later, a team at the University of Birmingham has declared the Mesolithic calendar to be the oldest in the world. Okay, now it's just so funny because today I was listening to something else that's telling me, I don't remember it now, so I can't tell you the name of it and so on, that was saying this guy, um, he was talking about the Moors and he's talking about, he mentioned a calendar I can't remember the name of the calendar. Um, let me see if I can find it. I think I made a note. Um, yeah, the calendar, he was saying, it's called the Long Count Calendar. Now, I didn't look it up as yet, so, I mean, I can't say anything about it. Um, 
but at least if you want to look it up it's called the long count calendar which was made by black people in america he said 16 million years ago now you know from my first videos on this kind of topic with writing i don't like these very high numbers like 16 million and 10 million years and 500,000 years i don't like those kind of stuff scares me but i mean how can i say i mean i, I don't know but at least he's saying there was a long count calendar and they say it's 16 million years or so certainly that's much older than this 8000 bc calendar and what's with this strange bc and ad kind of stuff it's like somebody is just trying to trick us up trick the whole world they have somehow even though some disagree but have somehow decided that adam lived 4000 years ago so you want to say 4000 bc now maybe finding truth in the world would be a little bit easier if people would just have not come with all kinds of extra stuff to confuse us because i'm sure people way back then weren't talking about bc so when they came in with this bc stuff and ad stuff you know it's like when it's 2 AD, that would have been, what, 4002? And when it was, what would you call it now, 3998 um, BC? I mean, like, I, I don't know. It's like, it, it just, you have to do so much thinking just to calculate and so on. But the, this whole BC and AD thing... It, it means absolutely nothing to me. There's no wisdom in it. There's no smartness in it. It's very foolish. It's ultra foolish. And it's very, it, it's, it's very backward. Because it doesn't seem to me from all the things that I've been reading that people had a problem counting in ancient times. So for somebody to come and say, no, you lived in BC and we're living in AD, that's just very, very damn foolishness. It, it has no meaning in itself. None. It's just another way just to confuse the world. A lot of things are done just for the sake of complication. Complication. Truth is sometimes hidden by simplicity. So that something can be very, very simple. And so they don't have to hide it. It's just right in front of your face because you will never believe it. Even though you're looking at it, they're showing you it's right there. They don't even have to point it out because... I mean, if you're such an idiot to not see it, which all of us have been at and are still, you know, looking at some common things before so we can identify that that is the truth. But then also truth is sometimes complicated, right, in order to hide it. So anyway, oldest calendar. Um, okay, so before the discovery of the oldest calendar, previous versions dated to Mesopotamia period, period which goes back 5,000 years so okay so that's one um, let's see if there's any other oldest calendar here that they want to talk about thank you well okay I'm not finding any more right now like I'm seeing calendars but not the kind I'm looking for but But as you can see, that one that I mentioned, though, if it is correct, and, you know, some, sometimes it scares me the way they date these things, because sometimes it just seems, okay, something might be a little true with the dating. You can probably accept the dating a little bit. And then sometimes it just seems so incredible. But anyway, at least this one, 8000 BC. So obviously, people were making calendars at 8000 BC that's a couple thousand years before Adam lived in the garden and became the first man alive now here's something else I want to point out to you to with with the problem with this the presentation of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden if you look in the book of Jubilees which I haven't read but I'm I'm sure I probably have read like a verse or two of it someplace sometime if someone mentions something but I haven't read it eventually I'll read it but you got all these feasts mentioned in the book of Jubilees and the calculations of time and so on for the feasts and and also in the regular Old Testament we've got these feasts and so on and the feasts as we understand them must be done 
at certain specific times. So, if they must be done at certain times, people were keeping calendars. Now, if this is really 8,000 years old, um, then obviously people found a need to have calendars. So if we're going to offer these feasts, then if the Hebrews needed a calendar to to deal with their feasts and so on, because yeah, sure, they're watching the moon and whatever they're doing. But you're telling me these very wise Hebrews from the scriptures are written in Daniel and Numbers have he then making calendars, but they never feel a need to write calendars as well? But they are the ones given the the instructions of the Most High to keep feasts that must not be missed? And they never write stuff down? With the calendars and the dates and so on? Of course they would have. They're writing scrolls, they're writing books. So if they're writing calendars... It's no different from other people writing calendars in the other nations as well. And it seems that somebody got up 8,000 BC and was writing this one. So writing was there a very, very, very long time ago, it seems, from these things. And like I've said to you before, it is becoming more difficult to just deny all of these findings. Some I have denied all along, and some I still deny right now. But, I mean, the world is trying to communicate something. The world is trying to communicate something, that there are ancient things being found that are kind of mesmerizing. They just throw you for a daze in terms of the dating given to them. The world is telling you there's some kind of history that we all need to look at that goes back before a time when they said Adam was created. The world is saying that. And I have yet to find some kind of scripture where the creator said it is now 4000 BC, Adam, you are the first man alive. And give him a date. And right before I started this video, I, I'm not about to read it now, but they're looking at a, a timeline for Genesis and talking about how they decided that it was 4000 years ago that Adam was created. And then right under it, they said um, some people disagree and, and they're giving their objections or whatever. So that's something else to look into as well, because how did they know it was 4,000 years? All right, so if I move on now from this oldest calendar thing. Oh, another thing here to mention too before I move on. It says that Cain and Abel, they were... Offering their sacrifices, working, brought the stuff from the, the field and brought animal to offer as well. Now, if they're doing field work farming, they're using stuff like, um, like probably like sickles and, you know, plowing instruments. I forgot what you call this certain plowing instrument. But if you look at plowing instruments, plowshare or whatever you call it, I've been searching on that for a couple of months now to try to find the oldest um, or the first people who used the plowshare. Because that's going to help you to date the story of Cain and Abel, which gives you an even better idea of when Adam lived. So whoever is up to the task. <laughs> because, I mean, if they're doing farming, and they're using plowshare and so on and other such stuff then they've got technology it doesn't say that excuse me these people are just born Adam and Eve and then they had Cain and Abel and there's no technology everybody's primitive living in caves and so if they need to go and do crop work that Cain and Abel uh, and Adam and so on going out and using their bare fingers digging up the ground with their fingers because they know nothing about technology and never made any tools. They, they started digging with their hands and then later on in the, the evening cleaning out dirt from their fingernails. No, they had stuff. Notice they were offering a sacrifice. So they actually had stuff set up the way that the more... I It's probably a cheat to say modern world would do it because then Israel was in 
you know, it's not really modern like today, but it's not ancient as in the time of Adam. The Israel was offering sacrifices. The pagan nations were offering sacrifices. And when you deal with sacrifices, it's usually placed upon an altar. So it looks like the setting here that's talking about Cain and Abel doing their sacrifices, it's set in the same kind of way because he hit him with some kind of an instrument, apparently. Let me see what it says here. No, I'm in the wrong. Look at Genesis 4 verse 2. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a keeper of sheep. So this man just came out of the room of of the womb, excuse me, of of his mother Eve, just however many years before. Now he's keeping sheep. So it's like very, 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 very fast. They just grow up real fast. The earth has just been made or just been offered to them because they're just born, and all of a sudden they start to do something that seems so much for the uh, for a fitting into a, a built-up world. He's just a keeper of sheep. He just come out the womb, and he's a keeper of sheep. And the next one is a tiller of the ground, like he's using some kind of instrument and so on, and technology is now available to them. Now, we might have better stuff today, but it's still technology because, they, you know, they're doing this kind of stuff. So the story develops real fast, but but still, it shows that they've got technology. And if you don't think there was technology, didn't... Let, let's read the other one and come back to that. Look at the technology. Genesis chapter 3 verse 24. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden. And you notice again, you see how this is, you see what I tell you about writing and even the Hebrew, stuff, Hebrew language and so on I'm searching on and deal with writing. Because the story is, is offered to us about Genesis and the garden of Eden and so on in a very modern kind of way, till they've got even directions mentioned. It didn't just simply say, you know, because when you deal with the Hebrew language as well, I'm searching for the first language and what the Hebrews actually spoke, what Abraham spoke and so on. Um, it is. It seems incredible to me that all these people, and I'm going to get to them in a little bit, that all these people just remembered, remembered, remembered everything that they never wrote down. Each one of them live and die. Each one of them live and die, live and die, live and die, live and die. And they just all remember stuff in a very, very clear manner to give all this information to whoever passed it on to, to Moses. And he just wrote it down. And they carried it for generations in their mind. All these complicated things, even the book of Enoch. Can you imagine the stuff that's written in the book of Enoch? The complicated things that he mentioned. And they've got all this other stuff to remember from Genesis already, from creation story and the details of Adam and Eve and whoever else lived and so on. And then they've also got the power of mind to add in all the complications of divine instruction from the Creator to 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 um to Enoch that nobody has ever heard. And they can add in all the stuff from Enoch carried in their mind for a couple of thousand years or however long they did until they get to Moses so that Moses can write it down. Now they can rest their brains because they don't have to try to remember it so hard anymore because Moses wrote it down for us now. But look how modern it is placed here. So if people weren't writing and so on, they still seem developed in these other ways. So why weren't they writing? Developed, yeah, because look, they're mentioning the East and he placed at the east of the garden so if they weren't writing stuff down from way before Moses who wrote supposedly the Torah how did they remember all these fine details that it was the east that he came out of the garden these people are just born on the earth and just placed in the garden of Eden and they just given all kinds of directions from 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 who the creator is this is east this is whatever or did they just learn and grow and learn and figure out this is what they're going to call these things these directions and so on but they knew to write down at the time of Moses writing the Torah that it was placed at the east of the garden. Did the did the did Adam and Eve who were driven out know that they were exiting the garden from the east in order to pass on that information by only word of mouth and never writing it down? Adam never wrote down this stuff because he couldn't write, but he remembered that it was the east. 
so that he could tell it to the next person to the next person and so on or if he never wrote it down how did the next person who passed it on eventually know that they left the east because they never left from the east because he never wrote anything down it was just all word of mouth and if east was not yet a direction that was known or a word that was known how did they know that so it says and he placed at the east of the garden of eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life see that a flaming sword so when you look at them now, Cain and Abel, they're offering the sacrifice. They have an altar set up and they're having farming equipment and tools and so on to do their farm work and animal grazing or whatever they're doing. They have technology. Just like here in chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 24, there's technology there. There was a flaming sword and that was badass sword because this kind of sword actually was on fire. And we don't have swords on fire today. So technology was there. Swords were already being made. Made here on earth or made in heaven, wherever it came from. These angels here had a sword. That's technology. It's the first object that I can recall being in the Garden of Eden that was not something that seemed natural. Because I normally know a sword is being made from iron that people beat out and burn and so on. Everything else seemed like something was growing or something like that, right? But there's technology in the Garden of Eden. Although the cherubim seems kind of strange because where did cherubims really come from? So if we run back to chapter 4 now. So, so yeah. So Cain said, yeah, everybody's going to find me. Okay, I'm finished with that one. So everybody's going to find me. So he's kind of scared. Now, look at this Genesis timeline. They say now, commonly held, Adam was at 4000 BC, although some people have slightly different dates. Adam was at 4000 BC. Look at the problem with this so-called Paleo-Hebrew or Hebrew's original tongue. Um, um, uh, Adam at 4000 BC. Then there was Seth and Enos and Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, we know the well-known Enoch, Methuselah as well, Lamech, famous Noah again. So how many people is that so far? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They always say Enoch is the seventh from Adam. Then eight, nine, ten, Noah is the tenth from Adam. Shem, Arphaxed, Salah, Eber, Peleg, Reu, Serug, Nahor, Tira, Abraham. That's about 20. Abraham is like number 20. Now, I don't see Moses in this picture. So 20 people is a, a lot of people to just walk around with members in your mind and never write anything down, but are able to give all kinds of fine-tuned information to Moses to write an entorah, Torah set of scrolls. Twenty people. And they kept the supposed language alive as well. But instead of the language, actually, let me look at the writing here and just try to close this out. Now, I don't know about the life of all of these people. But Abraham's father was Tira. Now, what do we know about Tira that's significant? He was into idolatry. They say he he made and sold um, idols. And we know Abraham got sick of that and just wanted to get away from it. So what we find, though, is that these people being in the lineage of Adam did not necessarily hear about the Creator's truth and His instructions and His Torah. But yet you're telling me all these people kept not by writing because they couldn't write, but they just kept it in their mind and the living, and you get maybe some of them I don't know, but at least Tira, who's into straight idolatry, 
and he's so concerned about memorizing all the information that's for Torah to pass on to his son Abraham that it gets later passed on to Moses to document the Torah. This man is selling idols, so he doesn't really care about the Most High from his heart. And he's just going to give all kinds of details to remembering all the days of his life, the very, very clear instructions of the of all the, ins the Creator was trying to do, to pass on all this Torah information to Abraham. So Tira, an idolater, didn't just buy his own idols. He, he was so into it that he made it, so he's, his heart is totally gone. He doesn't care anything about this thing. But he devotes his whole mind power all the days of his life to preserving the true history of what happened in the garden to everybody coming down and to preserve all the Torah instructions that are going to come and pass on to Moses. And you're telling me he just did all of that from memory and he didn't care about it? So isn't it more likely that somebody wrote something down from way back then and it just got passed on? Because even if the man, Tira, in this example, didn't really care much about the Most High and serving the Creator instead of worshipping idols, even if he had access to the, the documents, he could have just been sitting in his tent somewhere in his house somewhere under some whatever. And maybe Abraham or somebody just took it when they're moving, right? Because he doesn't care about it, but Abraham might have cared. And I'm just supposing here, right? But I'm just saying it's easier to see the documents of something that was written being just stored, getting dust in it, or packed up in some whatever kind of stuff they used for boxes back then. And it's just stored. But I don't know. Maybe they really just all remembered it, even if they were worshipping idols. But by worshipping idols, they cared so much to remember the true history of everything.